So again, this is an awesome panel made of some awesome people at really cool projects, and they're going to be talking about developer tools, no gold without the shovel. Welcome. Um, hello. We'll keep this interactive, so whenever anyone has a question, uh, we could go ahead and field your questions as we go along. Uh, so let's have each of us uh, introduce each other. So going down. Hi, uh, I'm Prabhav, uh, co-founder of Stealthy, and we're building a decentralized communication protocol. So think WeChat for blockchain apps. Hi, I'm Jared. I'm a co-founder of Cambria, and we're doing frontier tech on blockchain a way to invent, incentivize people to do open collaboration where all the technology developed is open and people are rewarded accordingly instead of today's you know, secrets and patent systems and stuff like that. Hi. Hi, uh, my name is Vincent. I'm from Covalent. Uh, we are building a data control protocol. So basically thinking of your new FTP where when you transfer data, you can attach to a metadata saying that how do you want the data to be used? And as long as the data is within our blockchain network, it will be enforced. Tap, tap. Tap, tap. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm Yifen Shen. I'm from uh, Outchain. Uh, Outchain is building the next generation on high, on open and uh, uh, high performance uh, public chain. Yeah. Okay, so our panel is talking about developers' tools. No tools, uh, no gold without the shovel. So um, uh, let's start with your experiences as developers uh, with with building your your project and uh, what stack you guys are building on, or if you are building uh, a public ledger yourselves. Sure, uh, we are building Stealthy on Blockstack, so we use Blockstack for identity and authentication. Um, and to add to that, so. Blockstack is an off-chain first uh, blockchain. So what that means is only identity and storage lookup is stored on the blockchain, and everything else is off-chain. Uh, beyond that, we use React Native for our mobile application. So we just recently launched uh, Stealthy for iOS and Android. Um, and everything runs client-side, so there's no servers in between connecting people. So peop uh, you are connected in a decentralized fashion. Um, and t the most important thing that we do is basically allow applications to share data and features uh, securely. So this requires standardizing data and having people, uh, having applications share features uh, across cryptographic boundaries. So there's a lot of, in the background, there's a lot of on the fly encryption and decryption of features and data that's happening. So standardizing data is our biggest challenge that we're solving. Cool, and so at Cambria, our stack is pretty standard, I think. Uh, we run, we, we do all our coding in Remix, so pretty down to metal. We don't really use frameworks like Truffle. Um, we use something called Socket Cluster, which is a really cool way to do all the real-time stuff uh, between peers. Uh, and then we have a similarly React uh, on the front end uh, and, and some uh, Node.js stuff on the back end. Uh, prior to this, I was doing some, a lot of development for decentralized exchanges, so both uh, work on EtherDelta, some arbitrage work, as well as uh, building our own decentralized exchange. And I think a lot of that was interesting because you know, a lot of it was reverse engineering contracts that are already deployed and looking at how you can, can interact with them. So from doing that, I think I, had a, I got a lot of firsthand experience with you know, looking up the op codes and reversing things like that. And then I saw a need for a lot of better developer tools across all parts of the ecosystem. So happy to talk about this uh, today. Uh, I think this. So uh, the stack we're using, uh, because we're using the TEE, the Trusted Execution Environment, so we basically had to code a lot of low-level stuff in C++, um, some in C itself. Uh, but uh, the, the actual, well, the actual interface that developers will be interfaced with is more like a Python uh, language. So we basically took up our Python, uh, put all the data hooks in it that we want, and then we make it so that you can develop, write all your policies in Python. It, uh, we, we were deciding between, well, so Java doesn't really work in the framework. It's either Python or C++. We decided to go with Python first just because, you know, it's a data related project and a lot of people are used to using like NumPy and, and, and tools like that. So we basically made it all Python compatible. Cool. Uh, I guess my experience is kind of different because all these guys are using, actually, they are developing all users, the, um, the user of the tools. Uh, we are on the other side of the, the, uh, the scenario, like we are the public chain designer, so our job is more like uh, make the interface to um, developer more friendly. 
and how can we um, learn from, um, say, like, you, you know, like Ethereum ecosystem is the most mature now, and uh, most of the developer tools are based on that. And uh, what we want to do is, like, uh, um, I hope all the developer tools are more, like, agnostic to the uh, platform than so that um, you know, you don't know which uh, which chain is gonna winner as a winner uh, at the end. So if you make the developer tools more agnostic, and uh, it's easier to um, actually developer to switch to a different pub chain. And also, um, we are trying to learn how can we um, better native support for uh, building better tools. Yeah. Well, uh, building on that, I think I think with with the ethos of Cosmos, it, um, we're we're thinking that you you know it's not. It's not uh, just just like one public chain that's going to, to, to host the entire ecosystem of decentralized apps. Uh, it's more like there's going to be a lot of various choices um, that that you you could build on. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so so we talked a little bit yesterday uh, before we came to to, um, uh, to to prep for this panel, and and I know that uh, you you kind of. Um, uh, interviewed your user base to see what they wanted from out of a out of a stack, right? Uh, kind of, we are actively collecting the the data. Like currently, I mean, like our chain is just there at the beginning. So, um, what we are trying to do is uh, uh, start mimicking all the, the stacks, all the tools that uh, people are already using on for Ethereum. But uh, um, because underlying design for the public chain, the underlying design is different. Um, so there would be different uh, um, the mindset of using the tools. Um, so what we are trying to do is like see if uh, the design of the tool is uh, reasonable, is it because of the underlying um, infrastructure can support that, or is, is it because like it's just stupid? So what we are trying to do is um, collecting more data and uh, see um, can we do better than that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just want to add one thing. So when we did our project, our, our um, when we started Cambria on the blockchain, we picked Ethereum because at the time, you know, it's the most mature platform, most mature community. But we see the future, especially in all of blockchain, as being cross-chain. Right? I think I think there's so many good chains out there. They each have pros and cons. I think it, if you're if you're not a project that's tied to a specific chain, I think it behooves you to think early on about how you might do cross-chain interoperability and and all the frameworks that are coming out to support that, like cross-chain atomic swaps and stuff like that. Because at the end of the day, you, who knows who's going to win? You don't want to put your own company in a position of you know being being stuck. Say Ethereum one day. There's another spam attack, you know, and then you can't run your service. Does that cripple your company or anything like that? Or can you rely on other chains or move data around or migrate as needed? I think it's an important question we should all ask. So. Uh, and so, um, what are some of the some of the wish list items that you you as developers want to see in the ecosystem that you know, it currently isn't being addressed right now? So for us, um, I think the biggest thing, like. We kind of have a unique perspective where we started off as developers on Blockstack, and now we're trying to get uh, users to build on top of Stealthy's communication protocol. So when we first started off, we uh, have the same problem as every other developer. How do you get users on board? Uh, how do you get users, especially for a communication application, you need people in there to start talking. So after working with our partners, one thing we realized is they need channels, like public channels, where um, they can talk to their customers, they can talk to people that are using their application and get feedback directly. Um, the other thing that happens when you have like a bridging protocol like we do where everybody kind of plugs into us for communication is there's unique integrations that happen. So one example I'll give you is like when you have a decentralized social media or collaboration tools, you can take your Instagram photo, import it into a Google document and share it on a Telegram channel all through Stealthy because you have all these applications kind of building on top. So that becomes very straightforward. So you kind of, like, I'm sure you guys are familiar with Zapier. You have these like very unique integrations that are possible when these applications share data and features. So that's one of the things, the key things that we've heard from developers about like incorporating other features so they can focus on their core offering and not have to build everything else so they can build on top of existing infrastructure. Uh, so in our case, I think it's a lot about maturity and it's a lot about the speed and the quality of the tools out there. So you know, if you're a developer in the ETH community, I think you probably all use like, you know, Etherscan like we do. You're using like ETH gas station you know, to get the info on all that stuff. So all, if you look at all those pieces, there are part of the ecosystem being able to develop, deploy, and maintain an app on Ethereum. 
So these kind of tools need to be improved continuously. So perhaps there's a, either an initiative to clone some of these tools in a way that you can run in a decentralized way, so everyone can run their own copy of, for example, ETH gas station, or we sort of fund and push for these services out there to get better. Uh, another few things that we really like, you know, Infura. I don't know if ev any, everyone has used Infura before, but it's a, it's a lifesaver sometimes when you don't want to bring up a full node and you want to just interact with the blockchain, do some light reads and stuff like that. So again, like how do we get these services really, you know, with the funding and with the sort of feedback for them to really keep improving? I think it's a really important question. Also some basic stuff like just debugging, documentation, you know, the guts like using Web3.js, the original library and the new one, things break, things change, all this kind of stuff. How do we keep improving the level of that as we go and we make things more and more mature? I think that's something that I guess everyone in the community needs to figure out how to sort of pitch in a little bit and, and get that you know, as mature as possible. So. Uh, I think for Covalent, uh, we have two main pain points. Uh, number one is thinking from ground up, right? What we want is that, as I said earlier, it's like a new FTP protocol, right? So you want to be, and the FTP protocol is not really tied to a specific application or specific stack, right? You can call it, you can use it from anywhere you want. That's really, speaking from ground, ground up, that's kind of the thing that we want, right? The best thing we can do right now is probably having users being able to access us through a smart contract system in Ethereum. I think that's very, very restricted. I think it touches on the interoperability issues that we were talking about earlier. At least have it so that you know most of the uh, uh, public chains will be able to use this service. And going one step beyond, right, it's about how a normal or, you know, uh, uh, I would say the Web2 developer, right, will be able to, uh, how, how would they be able to use our protocol? So that's really from the ground up, the, the, the eventual goal that we go from. And then there are smaller problems, right? So for example, we don't really want to handle data storage ourselves, but the IPFS system, it, it is very difficult for us to use. For example, we sometimes we write, we, we would like to implement something where, uh, you know, the file gets self-deleted, de right? Self-destructs after a certain condition, after a certain time, but it's very difficult to, to for that, uh, for the IPFS system to do. Uh, so we probably had to resort to some cloud storage or some traditional storage format, which has its own problems, especially incentives-wise, right? How do you make sure that your file is available and, and all that stuff? So on that front, we, we, we think that uh, we, def we definitely would love to see other projects making progress in that respect. Cool, I think you should talk to, uh, sorry, I forgot your name, but, but yeah, yeah, but yesterday, like he was mentioning his project, like the block stack, I, which kind of a bring our own uh, database strategy. I was uh, pretty interested in that, so, like probably you can talk to him. Uh, uh, I just want to echo to uh, Jared's uh, uh, comment, like, because uh, he, he mentioned like, like, like either scan is pretty slow and what can you do about that. And we also have a uh, uh, customer, like, uh, um, uh, coming to us, like, say that, um, like they don't want to run run, run full node, or even not not single uh, like line node. They just want a reliable like way you can uh, transmit your transaction, and you can get a uh, um, reliable uh, resend if that fails, and get a reliable uh, callback or push notification. And they just they just not willing to like set up a, a even a, like a line node. And uh, we we did see like the the business the business there. Like I feel. Um, there would be a lot of middleware um, service provider, and they can uh, build this uh, like a gateway, which can help uh, developers. Um, if uh, like the developers can just uh, focus on their core devel um, core logic and the reuse, uh, definitely that's a pro for, for profit. Um, but I think that uh, give you a peace of mind and uh, provide this service can help you to re um, uh, just a reliable route to your transaction and do push notification and the callback stuff like that. And uh, as we are a uh, public chain designer, we, we uh, definitely want more and more of uh, such a middle layer um, service provider to be there, yeah. And let me add one more thing. So I think if any of you have built a dApp or whatever, I think one of the cool things that you learn is like the user experience you have to provide is so different from what you users typically expect, right? So you go and you go, you know, today you go to whatever online services, everything's Ajax, everything's responsive. Now you go, you click a button to do something and then you wait sort of a, interminable amount of time, you're like, oh, is this gonna take like, you know, 15 seconds, is gonna take like three minutes or whatever? How much gas do I put? There's so many questions. So how do we build libraries that stop the developers from having to reinvent the wheel all the time? How can we all share a library for asynchronous updates, which is a combination of user experience and of the backend logic for that user experience and make it really clear? Because, you know, I think when I was, you know, teaching other people to do stuff on chain for the first time, and a lot of the questions they get when using even simple stuff like, you know, Ether Delta or, or like my ether wallet and stuff, they're like, oh, well, like what happened? Did it actually go through? You know, where's my transaction? <laughs> it's like disappeared, you know? So I think a lot of solving that stuff as a whole, I think it would be really great for the community. Yeah, um, one of the interesting points was that 
Um, as developers, how do you how do you reconcile how much decentralization you want versus um, how good of a user experience? You know, how fast you want to you want you want to reach your you reach your users um, um, with, with with your platform. So uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about how you guys make these decisions and trade offs. Uh. Sure. Um, so for us, since we use Blockstack, uh, one of the interesting things is the off chain light ledger method. So we get the security of decentralization because your identity and authentication is done based on a, block, a blockchain. But all your data is stored on a cloud service of your choice. So you can put it on S3 or Dropbox or whatever. And your data is encrypted client side. So before it even gets to the cloud storage, it's already encrypted. So it's a dummy storage uh, endpoint. So what this gives is a very, like, as far as performance, it's near identical to centralized services, but you also have the security. Now, since we're building a chat application and we weren't able to find a reliable push notification system that's totally decentralized, what we did is we added a convenience where you use Firebase for notifications. And if users are really paranoid or don't want to use uh, any centralized services, we give them an option to basically disable it. And based, uh, they need to check the tool if, to, if they have messages. So offering like a hybrid solution where people still get the conveniences and the usability of centralized services is really important because you're not going to get the buy-in from developers or end users if it's 10 times more difficult to use the application as centralized services. So having that performance being uh, reliable and also you know, being OK with a hybrid solution because you're not going to completely decentralized right off the bat. Eventually, you know, when one of the you awesome developers writes a decentralized push notification system, we definitely want to incorporate more decentralized technology. So again, to add, to add on to that, like a IPFS is one of the things that we want to integrate into Stealthy because we want to offer users a totally decentralized stack. And if they want to continue using cloud storage, more power to them. Cool, yeah, I echo the same sentiments, I think. Practically speaking, you know, if you're not just crypto maximalist <laughs> alone, you know, I think you, you really need to build apps today that are hybrid between, you know, legacy centralized stuff, centralized notifications, but where the key value is held on chain. And so I think a lot of the time spent, again, maybe this is a, t a time for a good framework that encompasses sort of real time notifications with uh, cha on chain stuff. But I think it's definitely some, you know, something to know that it's hard to build an app that has a good user experience that is all on chain. And I think the, the biggest thing there is like, you know, what crypto I feel like needs now is we need like validation, right? We need to show that are the use cases that we're pushing are all the ones like, you know, that are getting, you know, 100,000 users, you know, a million users. And I think without having better ex user experience right now, I think things again, like I'm optimistic. So I think things will get to the point with sharding and everything where we can do a ton of stuff on chain, but still you got to make compromises for now in order to improve, improve the user experience. So. Uh, I think, uh, for decentralization, it's, it's important to think why, uh, which part of your system needs decentralization. For, for us, it's pretty clear. It's basically whoever touches on the data, whoever uh, handles the transfer, like a storage of data, where they might abuse it. These are the parts that really need, need decentralization. And we try to really make sure that every other part, it's uh, basically familiar to the user, whether it's centralized or decentralized, whatever system that they prefer to use. Um, I think that another, a, a very interesting traditional company called Alchemy, uh, I think it's based in Boston. It's basically a CDN provider, one of the largest uh, provider of uh, internet infrastructure, right? So uh, think about, I think Covalent is more like a decentralized CDN type of uh, uh, layout, right? So for Akamai is that when you transfer data from you know, New York or, or to China, you probably route through a lot of nodes, right? You pre-store them and whatever, so you make sure that the delivery is fast. But the problem with this is that all the servers are owned by Akamai, right? That's the problem with centralization because all your data goes through them. The crypto, uh, encrypted or not, basically, uh, in a sense, we don't really want this to happen. We don't want people to be able to control the flow of your data, right? So this is the part that we're trying to make decentralized. Hence, uh, we use the TE, right, as I said. So that's really the part that for us is decentralized. All the miners run the TEs. So that it's like saying that you have a CDN, Akamai type network, except every node is owned by different people. And these people can really collude uh, to, to you know, steal the data of the network and anything, uh, something like that. Uh, for the user, experience question, we really just try to do uh, whatever is 
already previously familiar with our uh, target users or developers, right? For now, for example, we can inter we can hook it up with like IPython notebook, right? If you just open a Jupyter notebook and then it's kind of similar interface that you use. You write Python in a Jupyter notebook environment, except that you can call a class, right? It can basically import class, and then we can make sure that all the routines are there. And so it's very familiar, uh, simple to use. We don't need to re-educate people about a, a new user experience. I think that's too much hurdle for us. Yeah. Cool. Um, so just at a small point, it's like um, um, I think definitely I agree that like not all the full stack should be decentralized, but a lot of the time it's um, um, if people get too stuck with Ethereum, it's um, they actually I see that like people uh, developers just care too much about the gas usage, um, so uh, if some task like requires too amount of computational resources, that um, the developer might just willing to move it off chain. Um, I think uh, what we can do, uh, not totally solve it, but like, I think uh, um, our chain can alleviate it, that is uh, um, manifold. Like one is we can have a better um, um, virtual machine that run uh, with more efficiency. So uh, you don't worry, um, you don't have like very slow code there. Uh, you don't have to worry about the, um, the time limitation there. And the other one is uh, the, m the model of the, uh, uh, the resource usage. Um, I think I just totally don't like the, the, the gas usage model there. Like you have to, s developers just have to like s care too much about how to like uh, reverse engineer the code to get a better like uh, uh, gas oriented uh, source code. That's just a nightmare. Um, so what we can do is we can offer a more flexible uh, resource usage uh, uh, like a rental model. Uh, it's more flexible like you can um, uh, either pay as you go, or you can rent uh, like for a month or something like that. So developers don't have to worry about this thing. And they, they can just use it and uh, more focus on that developer, like, like the business logic there. So that's what we can offer to the developers. And with that uh, enabled, I think then um, m people are more willing to um, bring those, um, uh, which was uh, not possible on Ethereum to be on chain and bring those things on chain on other, on at least like on our platform, yeah. Uh, so Ethereum is arguably the most mature developer, uh, it has the most mature developer ecosystem, it has uh, a ton of integrations, um, but there's still a lot to be desired. Um, what are some of the pain points that you guys have experienced uh, building with whatever stack that you know, you're building on, Blockstack, Ultrano? Sure. Um, so Blockstack is written, like the code that we're using is primarily in JavaScript, um, and they give you the identity, the storage endpoints. So for us, it was pretty straightforward to write, like we did a web app, uh, mobile and iOS and Android, um, and are starting to work on our protocol now, so all that in about 10 months. So we were able to get started and get going really quickly. And I think that's a very important point to make is, uh, I think Jared mentioned this earlier, where Depending on your application, I think picking the right blockchain for that really helps. So when you have like a communication application, you have something that requires a lot of throughput, you can't put everything on a blockchain. You're gonna lose a lot of like usability, it's gonna be expensive. So for us, doing that was the biggest uh, saver. And then to add on to that, you know, to help developers build on top of Stealthy, like what we've done is I'll incentivize them where they don't have to learn the whole block stack ecosystem. They don't have to learn the identity and authentication. So if you're a developer and you just want to write like a messaging integration, so for example, you have a desktop app that you've written in React and you just want to have like exposure to mobile, you can do that by just having a simple messaging integration where people can f post to your uh, website through Stealthy. So we've lowered the barrier even more where it's like a two or three file two or three page uh, React uh, JavaScript file where you can immediately expose your application to decentralization and to mobile. Um, and then you can even write just features. So for example, sharing and liking is something that's common to a lot of social media. And there's other social media platforms that are being integrated in Stealthy. So you can write a sharing module that can be used in like multiple applications. So giving developers that, you know, way to like wet their feet and an entry into decentralization and lowering that barrier is very important. Yeah, I think so 
In our case, I would argue, I think, the time of the EVM it will be up at some point, and switching to a more mature VM, like uh, the WebAssembly or something like that, I believe is a good choice, because then you can have a whole suite of tools built around it. I, there's a, sometimes I struggle with like, you know, call stack too deep, too many operators, all this kind of stuff, and you're like, why, why are, these, are there these restrictions? And uh, I think it's amazing what they built in a short time, the EVM, in order to fulfill the needs, but I think as the community is moving, I think we're moving to EWASM, yeah, WebAssembly, and I think that's like the right direction. Um, I think that is actually, when you get down to it, I think the other half of the, the issues are around security. So everyone wants, you know, now code is like the rule of law, right? When you put out your contract that takes someone's money, how do you know that, <laughs> you know, poof, there it goes or something like that. So I think the whole space around audits, maybe both static and dynamic code analysis and stuff like that, I think that's a hugely important area, especially when people are trusting the blockchain with, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of value. And so I think, you know, if, if junior mistakes in a contract can cripple your entire contract with your entire company's holdings, then you're basically, you've, you've just killed your entire, you know, company with like a one-line bug, right? And so I think people, you know, tools around that in the ecosystem and maybe like a way to reuse sort of vetted or trusted small pieces of code, you know, easily. I think those are some of the really important things for the ecosystem as a whole. Uh, so for us, um, Basically, uh, two problems. Uh, n number one is we, first of all, we only use these public chains, for example, Ethereum, as a transaction record, right? We don't actually do anything fancy with it. Everything we do is kind of off-chain or, or in our network. Uh, our network efficiency, it, it's very high because TE, right, you don't really, you, you, the proof really comes for free. So you have one node execute something and then the proof is automatically generated. We don't really need like the zero knowledge proof, um, all that type of stuff, it just, just comes pretty directly. Uh, so we use Ethereum for transaction, and then you I, obviously right the, the 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 issues that you run into scalability throughput and and, and all that stuff. So that's uh, gas, and that that's our number one problem. Uh, the number two problem is basically uh, a way to store a secret number um, on on these public chains. Uh, it's been very very difficult. I think this is a, a, a very tangible and uh, important issue that we are running into. If you can figure out how to store a secret number on a public chain, uh, it really prevents you from, from doing most of the uh, you know, uh, security privacy stuff uh, or anything you want to integrate uh, with it. Cool, uh, so, so we are actually using, uh, so our chain is actually using WebAssembly as a virtual machine, so welcome to try it out. Um, so secondly, about the pain point of the Ethereum, and so what I heard most um, is, um, so first is the gas model, like which I already said, um, just it's a nightmare. Um, the other one is um, probably is the um, uh, it's more about a mindset, like uh, when you're transitioning from uh, uh, like a mobile app developer to this uh, blockchain world, it's uh, uh, the non-deterministic. It's uh, probably the probabilistic uh, finality, like you you get the transaction like packed into a block, but like six six blocks later, like you 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 kind of get the confidence it's got in, but you never know it's gonna revert it or not. That's kind of the mindset, like, which um, is kind of mind-blowing, like, at the first place. Um, um, I think the, the key, key, um, key point is, um, um, so it doesn't have to be that way, right? It's, uh, it's just because you, you schedule usage, it doesn't mean it has to be that. It's because the underlying uh, consensus model is, uh, is non-deterministic. So the, um, and, uh, but our chain is different, like we, um, um, it's a different uh, set of the uh, model, it's called deterministic finality, so you, you once your uh, transaction gets into the, the block, it's finalized. It's then no way to revert, so essentially there's no fork that can happen there. So I think that point is, uh, kind of gives the developer uh, uh, more, um, more peace of mind, yeah, that's it. So, um most of the paradigms that we've we've uh, talked about in, in this discussion was the the concept of uh, one VM in which uh, in, in, in which applications could could use um, uh, for decentralization and you know maybe with Blockstack there's off chain um, um, uh, platforms that you could use. Um, what Cosmos provo proposes is that you could run your application as your own chain. Um, what are your guys' thoughts about that as uh, a different architecture? So that's interesting. Uh, we are thinking about you know having our own token, and we actually were wondering if you know having our own chain even makes sense. So uh, a good example is notifications. Like that just keeps coming back. Where you're like, okay, how do we get notifications in a decentralized way? Is that even something important? 
Um, we also want to store other things on chain. So for example, uh, one of the things that happened when we released our app uh, on iOS and Android is China immediately pulled it from the app store. So we were like, okay, we know what we should do. We should just put the APK on, on a chain and just distribute it that way so they can't censor that. So it would be very interesting for us to put only certain things on a chain like that that really need to be decentralized, that really need to be out there, whether it be for censorship proof or for some other reason. Because uh, you know it's one of the things where it needs to happen, but we, it, we're still a little bit away from doing that, but that's a model that we've definitely explored. Yeah, I think for us, uh, doing stuff off-chain has always been very interesting, or side-chains. I think the trick is that you know when you create chains, depending on how you implement it, you may or may not create you know sort of security problems for yourself. Like if you're really running a chain and expecting it to not be compromised in some way, if you're doing a like a really distributed type of chain, if you're really running a chain that's like you know like proof of authority or anything, then in which case you're really running a database and that people can talk to, which is which is nice. It's, it's a database with some semantics and APIs, but it's not like a broad fully distributed censorship resistant chain in the way that m like large public blockchains are today. So I think you know for us, um, especially when I was doing decentralized exchange work, we were very interested in sort of the RAID and the Plasma work, right? I think that stuff is gonna be central to scaling in the short term. I think we'll, I think we'll eventually get to the point where a lot of the really hard sort of things will get fast enough, but it will always, you, no matter how thi fast things get, you'll, you'll be fast enough to do the, the majority of things, but to go, to push the envelope, you'll always need some off-chain work and off side chains. So I think, yeah, no matter what, I, I'm interested in that. I guess uh, we'll see how <laughs> we'll see how the side chains and stuff turn out off other private chains. So uh, I think the you know the Cosmos Big Chain VB line of thought. Uh, well, I I think it's 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 very well. So so the problem is that uh, basically in the end, right? You have all kinds of you have some public chains for transactions. Uh, you know, like the core thread of things, and then basically you need to be able to figure out how to write a D app where you use like, I don't know, 15 different protocols, right? From different ones. Right now, everybody is either doing their own chain or they're hooked up with specific chain. It's almost, it's, this is like the biggest problem. There's almost impossible for you to re like use a lot of other protocols very easily. It's, it's very, very, very difficult. For us, we basically use Ethereum to store the transaction because we don't want to handle the money, right? That, that, because we don't want to be responsible for that, for that area. That's the only one reason that we use it. Uh, we've looked into Cosmos and basically writing our own chain as a Cosmos most, but you know, the environment, the, the, the ecosystem really needs to be there. It's like a chicken and egg kind of problem, right? If everybody is already in Cosmos, I think there's merits to that. Um, well, the consensus, I think it's okay, it's a little problematic, but I think, I think generally that's a good direction. But you know, if everybody's still running their own public chains, I think that it might be more, uh, the incentives really for the, for the whole crypto world is there so that you can make these public chains communicate to each other, right? And instead of, okay, let's everybody move into uh, another framework. I think that's very, very difficult uh, for incentives wise. Cool, so, so I'm definitely a big fan of the, um, the multi-chain architecture um, for scalability uh, reason. Um, so even today the topic is about uh, developer tools, but um, yeah, well, since you mentioned about the multi-chain architecture, uh, I will talk about a little about that. Uh, I, I have a, we have, a, uh, it's actually the big design um, philosophy of our architecture, and we, we are going to have uh, uh, details uh, product launch this afternoon at 4.15, also at this room. Uh, we, I will talk about the multi-chain architecture more in more details, but in short, um, um, I think that's the way for scalability. As uh, Jared mentioned that, that's a, a big uh, security issue. If like everyone is on its own chain, how can you um, like assure that it's secured? And uh, what we gave the, the answer is that um, um, we have a big pool. Uh, we, we consider all the, the uh, mining nodes as a pool and it's scheduled by the, the main chain and uh, then um, you don't get to pick up your own mining node and uh, the main chain gets scheduling all the mining nodes to the different chain and they randomly shall reach level that. That in a certain degree can assure the security level that. Like it doesn't sacrifice the security level for too, too much for the performance. It's the strike a good balance there, yeah. So if I can ask, um, what have you seen at Cosmos? Uh, what have you seen developers use the side chains for? What kind of use cases have you seen? Um, one of the applications uh, is building a video streaming app, and they have uh, upwards of 20,000 users right now. And so they're, uh, they're using Tendermint, and uh, they're running their own chains using uh, the SDK. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just, um, 
it's just a different paradigm in that uh, y it's written in Go, so people, you know, it, it has all the debugging tools um, that you w you would want um, with the language, mm. and so you kind of get get these things prepackaged, and 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 it's nice, uh, according to some some of those apps that are <laughs> that are using it. Um, so we have six minutes left. Maybe we'll open it up uh, to the audience if you guys have any specific questions to ask the panelists. Uh, we could have an open interactive Q&A session. Yeah, I can talk to a little bit about that. So I think, well, you definitely need a block explorer. <laughs> so you definitely, I think that's number one and something that's a lot faster and <laughs> more reliable than either scan. I mean, they do a great job, but still even, even better. Um, nice if you can run that decentralized, but then you, you have to run your full node, so that's, you know, it's up to you. Um, you definitely need a way where you don't, you know, your users largely don't need to think about pricing gas and all this stuff, right? So something like an ETH gas station, and in a way that's also tunable and controllable. So uh, I think that's really important. Um, I think those, those two are actually probably the most key to me, and then I think, you know, better, the better debugging tools is like a layer that cross cuts everything, probably across all different chains, all different execution frameworks like libraries, documentation, everything, I think is like the meat of it. That's just kind of like, you gotta keep working on that day after day and make that better. Um, but I think, yeah, I think, and then of course, like I mentioned before, security. I would say security is actually, in some ways, number one, because we're all waiting for like the shoe to drop on some contract exploit or something like that, right? But uh, I think it's, people have been comfortable in this space just moving fast and then kind of like bringing up security as we go, as the applications get bigger, which I think is an okay approach for now, depending on what space you're in, right? You have to be careful, but you know, it takes some time to get it right, I think, so. That's I'm a little biased, but I think for consumer dApps, a way to communicate. So right now, everybody's kind of building like single use apps. Like how do you share content from that app for other users in that app? Or how do you chat with other users? So imagine like there's a lot of like gaming apps on Ethereum. Like I would imagine like a Twitch style like chat platform where people can talk to users that are playing the game or people watching the game. Sure, uh, if uh, you can like scale that and if it's a possibility to like integrate that into other apps, yeah, of course. That's a great question, I think in general, because code is law, I think a lot of it is around the code, but it's also around handling. So when companies and programmers are all having access to, let's say, you know, who's pushing, who's who's auditing every commit that happens, who's auditing the new, like uh, the new modules you deploy that connect to the existing smart contracts out there, what's that process look like? And in many companies, I think in the blockchain world, we're all moving fast, right? Who, where there's no <laughs> a lot of not not much, not as much process as we all probably like and stuff. But I think there's a big potential for risks there. It would take, you know, probably relatively trivial for someone to hide some kind of bug, right, who's a developer or contracted out to write this contract and put in a line where you can, you know, call the, that contract. So how do we solve those things? Yeah. Any other questions? We got time for maybe one more. Right up here. Interesting. You mean for blockchain in for general? Yeah, or? That's a good question. I think it's showing value. <laughs> so if you can show value, and then you can get people to put come in. Yeah. Uh, I think for us, uh, having them to get like a platform where they can expose their code and their content. So with Stealthy, you can actually like go open up their apps through our mobile app. So just because they wrote code doesn't mean like it's being hidden somewhere. So you can actually see their messaging integration being worked there. And once we release a token, we plan on attributing value back to them where okay, your extension got used so many times, so you get this much amount of tokens for that. So you add value and uh, you actually get exposure through our mobile platform for that. 
So uh, let me ask him. So we, we're actually in the process of open sourcing. And then the way we look at it, because we actually think that you know, talent is pretty exponential, right? When you look at a really successful open source project, there's probably this top five to 10 people that contribute 95% of the code, right? So for me, for us, well, the way we think of it is less of altruism, more like pride. So if you get the really talented tail people to take pride in saying that, okay, this repo is going to you know, be the best repo for some uh, specific region, and then you get them to see that, and then you get them to be willing to work on that. And I think it really only takes two, five or six convictions for this to really take off as a, as a good open source project. And then one last thing, community, oh, sorry. One last thing, community-wise, I think it's all about projects funding each other. So we have so much common interest. How do we you know, donate to the, the projects that need it most, and how do we expose that so we all know in the community what projects need the help, or how, how, how should we assist best? So uh, one of the projects that I want to give a shout out to that is doing exactly that they've they've um, is Handshake. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, so the Handshake project, what what Joseph Poon introduced was something called an abundance game. And what they've done is they've created the blo a blockchain, they've created a native token, and then they're airdropping it to the FOSS community, like w using just PGP keys and SSH keys. Um, and so so it's not so much altruism as it is. Um, paying back people who contributed code for free uh, and not expecting anything in, in return. And yet the token gets more valuable as they um, build more integrations for this, um, this, this, this project. And, and, and so, so, uh, so instead, what they do instead of uh, airdropping it to existing token holders, so, so uh, existing cryptocurrency people, they're airdropping it to people that are outside of this niche community um, and 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 uh, pulling in people who are in the FOSS community with the ability to build uh, more, and uh, later on down the line they're doing something called an airdrop to the world. Basically, they want to want to give handshake tokens to every single person in the world through uh, various means, like you know people in India or something stamp their finger, and then you get some handshake tokens that are you know later on down the line I I suspect will be worth a lot. So it's um it's totally incentivizing people uh, to build the ecosystem for this project, uh, and in return, it, it's, com it's completely selfish. But, but, but um, the, the output of that is that there's much greater value for the entire ecosystem as a result. And that's, that's what, what they call the abundance game, and I think that's very, very compelling, and it's worth studying uh, right now, because it's, it's not, not very known, but it's very compelling. Mm -hmm.